It staggers the imagination, the sheer volume of high explosives dropped in the Vietnam War. American warplanes delivered almost seven and a half million tons of bombs, more than three times our total for all of World War II. The helicopter came of age as a military machine. Thousands of helicopters ripping the jungle apart, hunting for an enemy who remained, for the most part, invisible. Aircraft carriers circled offshore, hurling fighter bombers into the sky. Giant B-52s delivered a devastating payload. They left the earth below marked like a moonscape. Seven and a half million tons, and the enemy fought on. The Vietnam War was a textbook study in the uses and limitations of air power. The American air war in Vietnam dates back to 1954, when communist forces overran the French at Dien Bien Phu. When the French pulled out, Americans took over the training of South Vietnamese Air Force pilots. By 1961, American pilots were flying combat missions, but only if a South Vietnamese also was aboard. By 1965, that restriction had ended. American jets began flying regular missions, attacking enemy strongholds in South Vietnam. You will see the air war, as it was reported at the time by CBS News camera crews and correspondents. One of them, as it happened, was this correspondent. This is Lieutenant Colonel Dan Farr of Los Angeles, commander of the 8th Fighter Bomb Squadron here at Da Nang Air Base, a squadron equipped with B-57s, the British call them Canberra jets. We're using them very effectively here in this war in Vietnam to dive bomb uh, the Viet Cong in these jungles beyond Da Nang here. Colonel, what's our mission we're about to embark on? Well, our mission today, sir, is to report down to the site of the ambush 70 miles south of here and attempt to uh, kill the VC that perpetrated the ambush and that are still in the area back in the hills. The area we're going to bomb is only about 70 miles from Da Nang Air Base, but it's a long 70 miles out there to where the war is being fought. And that's forward air controller. He's up there on a small plane, flying low and spotting the Viet Cong. I see a, a white uh, plume of smoke. The colonel has just advised me that that is our target area right over there. And now we're making our pass. And we're beginning to go down. We're heading down toward that area. One, two, three, four, we dumped our bombs, and now a tremendous G-load as we pull out of that dive. Oh, I know something of what those astronauts must go through. Wow. And here we go into a steep uh, left bank with some more G-force there. Oh, oh boy. Oh. That G-force, I've got to ask the Colonel the first chance I get. He's a little busy right now, what that G-force is. We dropped our bombs, it looks to me as if just to the uh, right, which would be a little bit to the east of the earlier B-57 bombs, and it would appear to me we must have been just about on that uh, smoke plume. We're now flying almost wingtip to wingtip to our 6-1, our flight leader. And uh, we can see right in the cockpit of his plane. This is a very close formation. 
And as Colonel Farr says now, we're heading home. One measure of the air war was the number of sorties flown. A sortie is one mission by one airplane or helicopter. In the course of the Vietnam War, American aircraft flew almost 14 million sorties. These were some of the warplanes used. Phantom, Corsair, Intruder, F-111, Thunder Chief, B-52, Skyhawk, and Puff the Magic Dragon, also known as Spooky, a transport plane equipped with three Gatling guns, each capable of firing 6,000 rounds a minute. It flew at night to avoid ground fire, but carried flares to light up enemy positions. Puff was especially valuable in defending bases against nighttime attacks. A terrifying barrage of fire also was provided by helicopter gunships. One day in 1967, Bruce Morton went along on a helicopter mission. Below is the Iron Triangle, a free strike zone. Anything unusual down there is a target. Above 1,500 feet, the gunships are out of effective rifle range. Sometimes they attack from there. More often, they roar in a foot or two over the trees, dodging and twisting to avoid return fire, the most spectacular roller coaster in the world. The guns go off with a sound like a thousand rifles echoing in a small room. Those are rockets hitting, leaving their gray smoke trails behind them. Most of the targets are anonymous, like these. The thousands of rounds are aimed at map coordinates or a landscape feature, a hillside, a few houses. The pilots see their tracers going in. Sometimes they see the enemies coming back. They seldom see people. After a short run that seems long, the firing stops. Down below, nothing moves, anything living is hiding. Aboard the gunship, the noise of the motor, which was loud, seems almost quiet. Another weapon was Agent Orange, a chemical defoliant sprayed from airplanes to destroy the jungle below and deny the enemy some of his hiding places. The chemical also was used to destroy enemy food crops. More than 80,000 tons of these chemicals were dropped on Vietnam. They produced a continuing controversy. Thousands of American soldiers were exposed to Agent Orange. Many of those later developed cancer or other disorders and believed that Agent Orange was the cause. A class action suit against the manufacturers was settled out of court for $180 million. The effect on Vietnam's trees was easier to measure. Five and a half million acres of forest were partly destroyed, an area about the same as the state of Massachusetts. The air war took shape in South Vietnam, but it soon involved all of Indochina. Raids on North Vietnam began in 1964 as occasional reprisals for enemy attacks. The next year, 1965, a continuing bombing of North Vietnam began. It was called Operation Rolling Thunder, and it was the subject of fierce debate. Military leaders have been urging massive raids on North Vietnam. Air Force General Curtis LeMay suggested we bomb that country back into the Stone Age. But civilian leaders, including President Johnson, decided to escalate very gradually. They feared that all out bombing might bring Russia or China into the war. So the targets were carefully controlled by Washington. Bill Stout observed how it all worked in 1967. At that point, Rolling Thunder was two years old. This is the center of the target selection process, Pacific Headquarters in Hawaii. 
For these men, the working book of the air war is a thick volume of rules and permissible targets drawn up by the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington. The commanders in Vietnam of the 7th Air Force and the Navy carriers at sea send here their proposals for new targets or changes or concentrations of attack to meet tactical moves by the North Vietnamese. These target officers in Hawaii may drop some of the suggestions from the field or add proposals of their own, then forward the whole package to the Joint Chiefs in Washington. The Chiefs run the final screening, ruling out some targets perhaps, adding some of their own or checking others for White House approval. The list then returns here, where the target selection officers blend the orders from Washington with intelligence from Vietnam, reports from flyers, and photos from reconnaissance planes. The war is plotted here in the hills above Honolulu, and it is here the strike orders are drawn. There may be further refinement of the target list at Task Force 77, the powerful Navy strike group in the Gulf of Tonkin. The big punch of the force is delivered by air, by the planes of the carriers. There were three in the Gulf when this report was made a few days ago, the Kitty Hawk, Coral Sea, and Ticonderoga. Their fighters, bombers, and reconnaissance planes account for half of all the missions into North Vietnam. They go hurtling down the deck all day and into the night, the carriers recovering some planes at the same time others are being launched. The task force also has cruisers and destroyers, some patrolling the coastline, and supply and support vessels too. There are nearly 5,000 men on each carrier, all straining to give one flyer at a time a view like this of a single target in North Vietnam. These strike films provided by the Navy give some slight idea of what it's like. Targets that would be hard to find even without the missiles and anti-aircraft fire. The North Vietnamese are often ingenious. In one of these strikes, Admiral Richardson and his flyers found a whole string of railroad cars that had been passed over. The Vietnamese had painted two parallel lines on top of the cars so that a whole freight train looked like a stretch of empty track. But when the strike photos were studied on the Kitty Hawk, the experts looked beyond the rooftop paint job the flyers went back and blasted the train. The big air base at Da Nang in South Vietnam is shared by the Marines, but they fly very few missions to the north. Here, that part of the war is almost entirely Air Force. Shortly before the recent truce, CBS News went to Da Nang to cover a single mission over North Vietnam. It's here the decisions made in Honolulu and at the Pentagon finally are translated into men and machines, into rockets and bombs. Bomb tonnage figures are classified, but it's believed the total dropped on the north has been running at the rate of about a quarter million tons a year. Impressive, but far less than a single atomic bomb. On this mission, there were F-105 fighter bombers that usually operate from bases outside Vietnam. There were also F-4 Phantoms scheduled to fly escort in case MiGs went up to challenge the bombers. These are among the most complex and sophisticated aircraft in the world, but they're flown by men and men need instructions. Morning, gentlemen. Your target for this afternoon, as advertised, is the Mo Trang Railroad Bridge, North Vietnam. The geographical coordinates are 213030 North, 106 East. The target itself is an unserviceable railroad bridge under construction. It is considered to be probably deck type with three spans, 280 foot single track. There are two concrete piers and two concrete abutments that have been complete. Your route into the target from Da Nang through standard refueling over the Gulf of Tonkin, coasting in on the island point as shown, staying well clear of the communist Chinese border. You will then ingress just north of the flak area as shown outlined in black these are very heavy, AAA, 3757 and 85 100 millimeter anti-aircraft sights. You will also notice that you are staying just north of the surface-to-air missile range, as outlined in red. Very heavy activity can be expected in the target area. Activity also has been very heavy, these two sites just northeast of Hai Phong. Coming in, you will then enter the SAM envelope, passing north of Kep Airfield, you can expect a defensive reaction from the MiG Force located at Kep. Through your pop-up point, 
down into your target, at which time you will enter again the heavy flak area. Out, the reverse route, and back down to your post-strike refueling. If you are hit, gentlemen, by any type of defenses, your best chance of rescue is provided out in the Gulf of Tonkin. Try and stay with your aircraft as long as possible. Make sure you do clear the shoreline. Give the Jolly Greens and the rest of the SAR people a good chance to pick you up off the shore. If you're down close to shore, you can expect a heavy defensive reaction from shore batteries. The fighter pilots have heard about the target, how to get in and get back. Then they gather in a squadron briefing to talk about tactics right, yes, over the target. Uh, the flight leader today is Colonel Don Stanfield. Call the SAM to me with a standard call. Otter flight, SAM, 11 o'clock. As soon as I pick it up, I'll watch it through the windscreen. If the SAM doesn't move in any direction, we know it is being guided to our formation. If it moves a little to the left or the right or around from its original position, we know it's generally not headed towards our flight. In which case, we'll disregard it, not execute a break, just keep our eyes on it. If I think it's going to engage our flight, I will call a SAM break. Otter flight, break now. We will take our aircraft down and take them down fast. As soon as the SAM has passed us, we'll continue our maneuver on back up, back into our cover mission for the strike aircraft. In the personal equipment room, just in case they fail to outrun the enemy, much of their preparation is designed for survival, just in case a plane goes down. Everything from fishing kits to signal radios and sidearms. The last piece of gear on the way out the door is the helmet, a custom fit, and each man checks to make sure he gets his own. The men are ready, the planes are ready, but the Motrang Bridge is not. The word from the weatherman is that the primary target is socked in. A cloud layer so low that to fly beneath it would mean murderous small arms and anti-aircraft fire, while above the clouds, radar-guided SAMs could close in and the flyers might not see them until too late. Around the secondary target, no MiGs are expected, so the Phantoms are stripped of most of their armament and loaded with bombs. On the secondary, instead of flying escort, they will work as bombers too. The bombs are given their fuses right here on the flight line, a short walk from headquarters. But airmen say it is not as touchy as it looks to a civilian. The bombs and other weapons are not fully armed, cocked and ready to go until the red arming tags are removed at the far end of the runway. The Da Nang Tower is one of the busiest in the world. Under the rules of U.S. partnership in this war, the man in charge of the tower is a Vietnamese. They're cleared for takeoff, and three and a half or four hours after the start of the briefing, they leave on time and head north. In two and a half hours, they will be back. Hopefully, all of them will be back. After refueling, the planes move off in close formation into North Vietnam. Several planes on this mission carried cameras, as they often do for intelligence purposes, to show target areas and the damage done by the raids. This is only part of the film. Some of it was seen by intelligence officers as classified material and therefore not released for this report.
Two and a half hours after takeoff, almost to the minute, they return to Da Nang. The men on the flight line and in the fueling area stand much the same vigil as their predecessors did in World War II and even World War I. They have no radio communication. They count the planes as they come in. The Phantom leader, Colonel Stanfield, is the first on the ground. He's 45 years old. He flew in the China-Burma-India theater during World War II and flew again in Korea. He tells his men to keep working every minute they're in the air, looking for Sams, looking for Migs. Keep turning your heads, he tells them, adding that he wants them to come back from every mission as soaked in sweat as he is. Exuberance is genuine, partly pride in the job they've done, partly relief. It's been a good day, no one was hit, they all came back. That's the most sophisticated defensive area that I think any military, military forces have ever uh, been forced to face. Uh, and if it's bad now, imagine what it will be six months from now, then a year from now. They, they keep building on it. It is a very sophisticated defense, and it will get tougher. And your operations will have to be tailored to it. I've heard some of the pilots say that uh, it's worse around Hanoi than Berlin was in World War II. What do you think of that? Well, some days, uh, some days our people go in, and uh, and there's uh, appears to be a light to moderate flak, and there are other days in which the air turns brown. Operation Rolling Thunder was a high-risk occupation. North Vietnam's air defenses became increasingly effective using weapons provided by China and Russia. The surface-to-air missiles, SAMs, could sometimes be avoided and sometimes not. Many pilots who survived became prisoners of war, captured and often beaten by the people they had just been bombing. Then they were taken to prisons where most were brutalized again. Some pilots were luckier. On this day in 1967, a warplane landed on the carrier Intrepid with part of one wing missing. Did the enemy throw up much resistance today? Very heavy, some of the heaviest I've ever seen. We had surface-to-air missiles, heavy anti-aircraft fire, and there were MiGs in the area, although we did not see any. I was hit in the wing. I understand your planes have been hit before. Uh, yes, I've been lucky. I've been hit seven times. I was shot down once, managed to make it over the water, and ejected, picked up safely. Some of the bombs were dropped on Hanoi, the North Vietnamese capital. And what you are seeing is part of a giant civil defense program. All over the city, little one-person bomb shelters had been constructed. In case of an air raid alert, People ran to the nearest shelter and waited to pull the concrete lids over their heads. These scenes were filmed during a visit to Hanoi by CBS News correspondent Charles Collingwood. The making of the concrete tubes for these one-man shelters is a major industry in North Vietnam. There must be millions of them. The government puts them in public places, but a householder is expected to buy his own. They cost seven dong, or about two dollars at the official rate. The government takes a loss because they cost 15 dong, or about four dollars and a quarter, to make. There are so many of these individual shelters sunk into the ground that at least in Hanoi, which has been little bombed, their open holes probably constitute a greater accident hazard than the bombs that do fall. On that same visit in 1968, Collingwood found North Vietnam coping with another result of the air war. In Hanoi, the great steel Dumer Bridge across the Red River, which connects Hanoi with almost everywhere else, has been cut by American bombs. This is U.S. Air Force film. 
For some reason, the North Vietnamese won't let you film the broken bridge. But they did let us show for the first time how they've managed to span the river in spite of the damage to the Dumer Bridge. They've rigged a pontoon bridge. By day, this bridge is dismantled. The pontoons moored and camouflaged beside the riverbank. Then in the late afternoon, when they think the danger of bombing has become less acute, they tow the pontoons up and put them into place. It takes an hour and a half from the time the sections leave the riverbank until the bridge is assembled. They put it together and take it apart like this every day. As soon as the pieces are joined, the traffic begins to flow. First, the pedestrians, walking quickly because they're only given so much time to get across. After the pedestrians, the vehicles, mostly military, mostly Russian-made, many of them new, some from China, Czechoslovakia, and Poland, as well as from Russia, some going back to the days of the French occupation. The traffic is one way. It goes in one direction for a while, and then one line is halted, and another crosses the river in the other direction. These are going south in convoys toward the battlefront. There are also two or three other pontoon bridges across the Red River for pedestrians and bicycles. But this main one is for the heavy traffic. The trucks cross in each direction all night long. Then at dawn, they take the bridge apart for the day. The target selection process imposed on Operation Rolling Thunder was designed in part to minimize civilian casualties, but inevitably, Civilians were wounded or killed in the raids on the north. Charles Collingwood was taken to a village five miles outside Hanoi where, the North Vietnamese said, American jets had dropped 45 bombs. The villagers watched silently as Collingwood filmed his report. The work of rebuilding the village of Conway has already begun. The neighbors have all joined together and brought in building materials to rebuild the houses that have been damaged. Just over here from where I'm standing stood the house of Mr. Ho, who himself was very badly wounded, lost one leg, still has an arm and a cast. He also lost three of his children in the bombing of February 29th. His wife spoke to me about it. And we found Two of them died in the center. And I could not find the third one. And at last, I found just a part of his body. In that raid, in that attack, three of my children was killed. They, they are 11 years old, 7 years old, and Operation Rolling Thunder ended in 1968 as President Johnson first curtailed and then ended altogether the bombing of North Vietnam. But eventually, as we will see, heavy bombing of the North would be resumed under President Richard Nixon. Both during the war and since, there's been much debate about the effectiveness of the air war in the North. Many in the military felt we had pulled our punches, that if we had gone all out, Early in the war, we could have ensured victory. They argued that the gradual buildup imposed by President Johnson gave North Vietnam precious time to disperse its industries and build up its air defenses. Others felt, however, that no amount of bombing would have brought North Vietnam to its knees and that heavier bombing, especially involving civilian losses, might only have hardened their determination to fight on. That argument may never be resolved. There's simply no way of proving either side. The air war also poured destruction on two of Vietnam's neighbors, Laos and Cambodia, where the targets included communist strongholds and infiltration routes. President Nixon began a secret bombing of Cambodia in 1969, ordered a brief invasion of that country in 1970, and continued the pressure thereafter.
Morton Dean reported one example. These men are commuters. Every day, they commute to work across the border to Cambodia. The total number of U.S. helicopter missions into Cambodia is a military secret, although it is known that more than 10,000 sorties were flown across the border in the last month alone. We go out and we look for activity and uh, in the form of trails, bunkers, hooches, uh, bicycles, vehicles, anything that would indicate the presence of NVA units. And, uh, and of course, we draw a lot of fire that way, and that's how we locate their positions. It's kind of a risky thing, locating the enemy by drawing his fire. I suppose you could say it that way, but uh, it's our job. And I'm going to call Max now. Come on out. Roger. On a typical mission, a Cobra gunship flies shotgun overhead, while a smaller chopper with two men aboard scouts the terrain below. Yeah, we got, uh, we got uh, bunkers. One, two, three, four, five, five bunker openings here. I'm going to put some... Uh, uh, zero, two, six, uh, we can call that Hardy. We're within range and they're ready and willing to fire. I'm going to put some more uh, 60 in your hooch here. Go ahead. There's a guy down there in that hooch. One right on our door. Uh, we got a fire on that one there. Uh, I think there's a tunnel complex under this too. I see a lot of uh, openings in the, uh, in the ground. When more firepower is called for, it is the Cobra's time to uncoil. What's supposed to be down there? Uh, but whatever it is, it's not too friendly. Filmed on another mission over Cambodia, the Cobra unleashes rockets and showers of flechettes, thousands of tiny nails. No nails do a trick on you. Bad one. Every mission is monitored back at the base in the Tactical Operations Center. We took about four tracer rounds of uh, 51 cal, which I guess means a total of 15 or 20 rounds. That's and Captain Al Seidel reporting that on this mission he has taken fire. However, he was not hit and is returning to base. It was a confirmed 51 cal position, and that means they're there, and we've nailed them down to a grid square. But uh, that means probably a main force element, because they're the only people that have 51s. The next team out there will avoid the grid square, but try to draw some fire out of it and pinpoint the location of it. Once that's done, then uh, air and artillery take over. Ten minutes later, Seidel relaxes with a game of cribbage. On the front porch of the bunkhouse, the crews call Tobacco Road. <laughs> Suddenly, the card game is interrupted by a sound that no one at Quan Loy likes to hear. Seidel knew what he was talking about. The next team did draw fire from that position, and a scout chopper has just been shot down. The siren has mobilized the whole base for the rescue effort. The rescue effort progresses swiftly, but not swiftly enough to satisfy a concerned officer who circles the crash site in a command and control helicopter. Or beginning to grow mad, I don't see the sling crew out here. Uh, they're standing by, they're in, uh, active. If they're standing by, it must be pretty goddamn stupid because there's three slicks running there and there's nobody coming out this direction. He is angry. While gunships have converged on the scene to secure the area, the sling, the helicopter that will lift out the down chopper, has not yet arrived. Don't give me a Roger. Send somebody with two legs down there and tell those people to get on this helicopter. The crewmen have been picked up. They are unhurt. Their rescue was a carefully coordinated team effort all the way. And hit the oil cooler, went through there. There was oil all over the place. It started, I had the engine oil bypass, got the caution light, and it started going up. And uh, 
Got up to about 140, I think, before we could find an area to put it down in. It was a real bad area. No structure. Well, like I said, I only saw that only saw that one area. I don't know how bad it was hit because we took off. They came in and picked us up. Fun and games. As you may recall, that report mentioned helicopters firing thousands of tiny nails at enemy positions. What sorts of weapons were these? Correspondent Dean decided to find out. The nails, or flechettes, as the manufacturer has labeled them, are carried aloft in these rockets by a Cobra gunship, each rocket packed with more than 2,000 nails, one of the deadliest anti-personnel weapons now in use. Ten rockets will carry almost as many nails as used to build a typical three-bedroom ranch house with garage. The payload of two rockets can tattoo an area the size of a football field, probably wounding or killing everyone in the area. This is the delivery system for the flechettes for the nails. Uh, right. Now, the, this, the entire basic round consists of the motor, which is forward of the fins, to this particular point. From the dark portion up to this point is comprised of the nails and the charge that pushes the nails uh, out of the tube when it uh, does fire. When it fires, this cone moves off and the nails will uh, disperse out into a pattern. Now the nails are all packed very tightly in there. Maybe you could show us just uh, what they look like. Now that's, that's one row of nails. There's about six rows up through this particular warhead. Now this is the red dye we see when the nails are fired. Right. What purpose does the dye serve? The only purpose I know of is just uh, so that they can tell that it has uh, expended out the nose of the particular carrier here. Correspondents are not permitted to fly actual combat missions in the gunship, but we were able to join Captain Bill Bunton on a maintenance run to check his weapons systems in a free fire zone. Captain, what type of targets do you prefer to use your nails against? What we prefer to uh, use against enemy personnel in the open is that they're the most effective. And we also like to use them against the enemy in trees because the nails will penetrate the trees all the way to the ground where our other rockets go off in the top of the tree. A number of empty ammunition crates have been dumped into the area and Captain Button will be firing at them. the nails will knife right through the target, although at certain angles they do have a tendency to tumble immediately on impact. And after piercing the skin, a tumbling nail can cause a gaping wound. Bill, it looks as if this strip was the strip facing the chopper as we came in on it. And how many hits uh, do you have here? It looks like we got one that hit here, one here, one in here, one in there, another one down here. Another one here, and another one down in here. It hit it pretty good along the side there. I think that's pretty good shooting. Yeah, I'm satisfied with it. Nails are also used in artillery rounds called beehives and in shotgun shells, which are especially effective in response to a roadside ambush. In a war where Allied troops use laser beams to locate their targets, scopes that permit them to see in the darkness of night, computers to guide their jet bombers, it is rather unusual to find that nails, inexpensive, not quite an inch and a half long, something you could hang a picture on, are such an important part of the U.S. arsenal. Those nails may have been one of the strangest weapons in Vietnam but they were only one part of a huge arsenal of destruction. Robert Shackney was shown some other examples. Here you see the, what we call a CBU dispenser. 
the bomblet itself and the, uh, this large dispenser is filled with approximately 400 smaller bomblets that weigh approximately uh, three pounds each. Uh, this particular item, as you see it here, is not dispensed from the aircraft or it doesn't fall off the aircraft like a bomb does. It uh, distributes these smaller bomblets that are contained inside of it out behind the aircraft. This is a thousand pound bomb and it happens to be the largest piece of ordnance the F-100 carries. This bomb, the general purpose high explosive, uh, is very effective in that, especially if we use a delayed fuse on it. It penetrates about eight to 10 feet into the ground and uh, makes a tremendous crater of uh, this particular bomb about 50 feet across at times if it goes off and it will, of course, uh, obliterate any of uh, the enemy's bunkers or his heavily defended areas. This is the napalm bomb that we use to uh, very effectively over here because it does get down into some of the bunkers that we do not actually destroy. It's a, uh, a fire bomb, you might say. The heart of this fire bomb, the napalm itself, is a mixture of gasoline and a thickening agent that forms a jelly which will stick to anything it touches. When this bomb explodes, the napalm will be ignited and splashed for 100 feet in every direction, burning with a fierce heat of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It was and is a terrifying weapon. Though much of the air war was geared to destruction, some of the most dangerous missions were dedicated to saving lives. These were the medevac helicopters, rescuing wounded GIs from the battlefield, often spelling the difference between life and death. John Lawrence reported one such story in South Vietnam, where a soldier had been left for dead for 24 hours. It was mid-afternoon when Alpha Company went back to the battlefield to find its dead. A soldier shouts that he has found an American body. Then, unbelieving, he cries out, he's alive. He's alive, sir. Oh, oh lay him right down, lay down, lay down. In fact, PFC Steve Hamlin of Lamont, California is just barely alive, a bullet wound in his head. A buddy had seen him shot the day before and reported him dead. Hamlin was new to Alpha Company and few of the other men knew much about him. Someone said he had just had a birthday, his 18th. Now begins a desperate and dramatic effort to keep him alive. The first responsibility belongs to the young medic, Specialist 5 Jasper Pasalacqua. Doc, you think, he, give me off. think you can save him? I think you'll yes, make sir. it all right. He'll live. Uh, 803, this is Crossbuck 5. I have a uh, patient for you. Uh, do you know about where we were located yesterday? Purple smoke marks the landing zone as the medevac helicopter arrives a few minutes later. This is Alpha Company's last look at the new PFC so few of the men ever got to know. A nearby field hospital is the first stop for PFC Hamlin. He's rushed inside for immediate blood transfusions, the first prescription for saving a life. Although he is still unconscious, the patient's pulse is steady and his heartbeat strong. The doctors decide to send him south to a bigger hospital with better facilities. This is the patient's second stop, the 85th evacuation hospital at Quignon. It has now been three days since he was wounded, two days since undergoing major surgery. His doctor is neurosurgeon Robert Fitzgerald. Doctor, how's the patient doing? I think we must be very cautious at this time in estimating his prognosis. Certainly he has had a very serious injury. However, he has survived this far and things do appear to be looking up a little bit for him. For the third time in three days, Hamlin is moved, this time to the airport for a flight from Vietnam to the Philippines and the huge hospital at Clark Air Force Base. This is the face of the young PFC who has been unconscious since he was shot and unaware of the fantastic effort to keep him alive. A few months later, Private Hamlin was recovering at Letterman Army Hospital in San Francisco. He talked with correspondent Harry Arrow. 
What, what do you hope to do after you get home, and after you get okay? Well, I was thinking about, uh, after I get, uh, get these plates put in my head, going back over to Vietnam. Going back to Vietnam? Right. What for? So I can get a Viet Cong in my sights, in my rifle sights. The Vietnam War was the first war in which helicopters were used extensively to rescue the wounded. Countless American fighting men survived because of these efforts. But the larger air war, the war of rockets and bullets and bombs, continued with a vengeance. One of the biggest targets of the Vietnam Air War was Laos. It was second only to South Vietnam and tonnage dropped. The bombing of Laos was two and a half times that of North Vietnam. Some of the raids were aimed at communist insurgents and others at the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the system of roads that the enemy used to carry men and supplies to the south. That campaign expanded in 1968 after the bombing of North Vietnam was halted. Many of the warplanes were reassigned to missions over Laos. When South Vietnamese troops invaded Laos in 1971, American planes provided air support. Pilots were convinced they made a big difference. It's not the only answer. Uh, that's pretty evident, but it it uh, it hurts them. You know that that's uh, ammunition and uh, storage supplies and gasoline that are going off down there. They're enjoyable missions because you're helping friendlies. You're uh, you you can see results of, of what you're doing. Uh, you can hear results. Uh, maybe a couple days later in the paper, you may even read results of what you're doing, uh, and that's always gratifying. Uh, to know that there are friendly people down there that are getting shot up, and to know that we're helping, uh, helping them, it's, uh, it's satisfying. The pilots were taking fire in Laos, but they said that wasn't the toughest part of the mission. The toughest part was landing back on the carrier. Some days, that was more of a problem than others. You've got two carriers out here on station. On a busy day, on occasion, does a pilot somehow, sometimes, land on the wrong carrier? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Not very often. Uh, it's happened. It's been known to happen. People you know are very close to you. <laughs> Maybe you can see me blushing, but, uh, well, that, yeah, it's happened before. Uh, and I did it once. So I'm gonna. It's, there's been a lot of guys do it, but uh, I'm not going to be the first to do it twice. I'll tell you that. Many of the land-based missions were launched from bases in Thailand. They were not widely publicized at the time because Thailand officially was neutral, but the bases were there and busy, as Phil Jones discovered in 1971. Utapau is the home of the B-52s in Southeast Asia, the planes that were originally built to carry atomic bombs, now outfitted with more than 21 tons of conventional bombs. American reporters are not permitted to film air bases in Thailand, primarily because the American government does not want the vast installations publicized. So these scenes were filmed surreptitiously the giant B-52s in their revetments. It is almost a cliche now that the air war is an impersonal war. The men who drop the bombs rarely see their targets or the results of their bombings. This is especially true of the men who fly in the B-52s. We talked with some of these crewmen as they relaxed off base just a few hours after a mission. They are professionals with no qualms about their job. They are convinced it is right and necessary. I feel that it does a lot of good. They, uh, I feel that they, uh, that the bombing doesn't kill any more than is necessary to, uh, to accomplish a mission. Without the air war and without the bombs being dropped, the uh, communists would probably eat us alive down there. And it's either them or us, the way I feel about it. If the war wasn't, uh, 
wasn't being fought here, it'd be fought somewhere else. You really think the bombs then are keeping the communists away? It is that important? Well, I can't say it's keeping them away. It's keeping them beat back to where they should be. Do you think it's effective? Of course it's effective. Or they wouldn't be doing it. Yuta Powell was one of five bases used by the Americans in Thailand. Correspondent Jones visited the others also, including one of the most secret, the base at Nakhon Phanom, often called simply NKP. This is the heart of the electronic war against the Ho Chi Minh Trail. There is a forest of antennas collecting information on enemy movements along the infiltration routes in Laos and Cambodia. Battery-operated sensors have been dropped along the trail, and they can pick up the sounds or ground vibrations caused by the enemy movements. These signals are then sent by radio listening aircraft overhead and relayed to this secret installation, where some of the largest computers in the world sort out the signals and feed the information to target analysts. As one expert has described it, we have wired the Ho Chi Minh Trail like a pinball machine, and every night we plug it in. Delivery systems are also increasingly complex. Some bombs are now guided by television or laser beams, and the Air Force officials say increased accuracy is definitely hurting the enemy. Udorn, also near the Laos border, just an 18-minute flight from North Vietnam. It is, in practice, the control point for the Indochina air war. These are the F-4 Phantoms taking off on a bombing mission. We saw, but were unable to film, enormous amounts of war supplies at Udorn. C-141 jet freighters are in and out all the time, hauling the supplies to some secret destination. Not all the supplies are for American planes. These T-28 prop fighters have Laotian markings. A Laotian pilot told us his Air Force comes to Udorn almost every day for maintenance and supplies, including bombs. And many of the airplanes have no markings, for Udorn is the center for many of the secret intelligence operations by the CIA. You will notice this C-130 transport has its tail markings concealed. Another busy base is Uban, located near the Laos-Cambodia border. It is the source of most F-4 activity against Cambodia. And due west of Uban is Karat. It once launched much of the bombing of North Vietnam. It still has a squadron of F-105s, and it is also base for the Super Constellation radar planes, which are vital to the electronic war. There are EB-66s, said to be radar jamming planes, capable of jamming radar which controls enemy anti-aircraft guns and missiles. The giant B-52 bombers also flew from Guam. Correspondent Jones went there too and found the bomber crews working around the clock. Do you ever think about uh, what those bombs are going to do, the damage they're going to cause? No, because we never see the damage, really, and there's nothing for us to think about. If you do, you go crazy thinking about the bombs, what they're going to do, kill people, blow up trees, monkeys, bananas, whatnot. Do you ever think about uh, civilians, innocent civilians being killed by those bombs? Well, all they tell us, they're bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and they say, there's Charlie, and so there's no innocent people there. So what can we do? Five, four, three... Two, one, now. 0730 Zulu, 1730. The pre flight Global. briefing, routine and technical, with only the words from the chaplain reminding them of what they are about to do. Our Father in heaven, we know that war is hell and our profession is peace. May our concern this evening being, be to bring about that peace. May we be concerned not only for our own personal safety, but that of the complete cell. We are willing, able, and ready to work as a team under your guidance for a peace. Protect us while we are away. And bring us safely back to our families. 
We ask this because of your past goodness to us. Amen. The mission is launched. It's called a cell, consisting of three airplanes. Watching as the heavy bombers fly off this Russian trawler. Today's target, enemy troops and tanks around Pleiku in South Vietnam's Central Highlands. Well, it means a long, long day in the neighborhood of maybe 17 hours. And uh, for a short period of time with the refueling and the radio calls and so forth until we get to the target, it's fairly busy and often quite interesting. From my standpoint, being a navigator, it's a, a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of navigation involved, and of course, timing has to be just right. Of course, that's my job, and uh, we're supposed to be professionals, and uh, I enjoy it. Of course, I don't like being away from home, but it's a job, and they send you to do it, so we try to do the best we can. At first, it kind of bothered me, and I wondered if I was really doing the right thing. But now I just wonder that if there are any friendlies in the area, and I can only hope that they're all out, and the target that we are, happen to be striking is what we're going after. And I believe that we are doing the right thing. I, uh, I've talked to a couple of these uh, Marines that have been on the ground that we saved down there at uh, on 10 case on they came back I've talked to them in these ambulatory cases down here in the hospital and they said you guys are the greatest in the world and, uh, and I I really think we're doing a good job the b-52s would be featured in the last big chapter of the Vietnam Air War in 1972 when the communists launched a big spring offensive President Nixon resumed heavy bombing of North Vietnam sending B-52s for the first time over Hanoi and its port of Haiphong. He also ordered the mining of Haiphong Harbor. The bombing was halted a few months later when peace talks appeared to be making progress. But when the talks bogged down in December, the president ordered the largest airstrikes of the war, raids that would go down in history as the Christmas bombings. They were costly to both sides. Last night, a U.S. Air Force B-52 crashed approximately 30 miles northwest of Hanoi after sustaining battle damage over North Vietnam. The six crew members are missing. Fifteen B-52s were shot down, along with 11 other American warplanes. North Vietnamese officials proudly displayed the wreckage. But American planes succeeded in dropping 40,000 tons of bombs around Hanoi and Haiphong. Again, many of the B-52s flew from Utapau in Thailand. As it happened, Bob Hope was also there conducting a Christmas show for the troops. Yes, sir, this is the home of the B-52, and sometimes known as Buff. Big, ugly, friendly fella. Especially when it's not dropping an egg roll on you. <laughs> Television cameras were allowed to film the B-52 crews watching the Christmas show, but were not allowed to interview them about the renewed bombing of the North. Off camera, many flyers seemed to approve the heavy air strikes. We should have done it six years ago, said one. The designated targets were military targets, and most of the bombing was accurate. But there were exceptions, and the world took notice. A Swedish reporter, Eric Erickson, described some of the damage. This is Hanoi, a little more than a week after the heavy aerial attacks carried out by B-52s and fighter bombers. I was here in Hanoi two months ago. When I returned here a few days ago, it was not the same Hanoi I saw. Uh, parts of this city do not longer exist. This is one of the bombed areas, the living quarters along the Cam Tien Street. Uh, I was told that 215 people were killed here, I have been in this area before and I have never been able to see anything that could be described as a military target. One of the residents of this area is Mrs. Le Kim Wan. 
She says, bombs fell right on the house where eight members of my family were, and they were all killed. This is the Bac Mai Hospital in Hanoi. It used to be the biggest hospital in North Vietnam. It was bombed on December the 22nd, early in the morning. Today, more than two weeks after the bombings, the staff are working here uh, to clear up among the ruins. There is no doubt that this, this hospital does not function as a hospital any longer. This is Eric Eriksson of Swedish Television reporting for CBS News. The Bach Mai Hospital was situated near an airfield, a military target. Some of the bombs went astray. The Christmas bombings may have accomplished their purpose. North Vietnam agreed to return to the conference table. A ceasefire agreement was signed in January 1973, and American troops were withdrawn from Vietnam. The peace would not endure, but the war would now be Vietnamese, not ours. The air war in Vietnam was waged at a terrible cost. Almost 8,000 planes and helicopters were destroyed. More than 8,000 airmen were killed in combat. But what did the air war accomplish? For one thing, it bought us time. Without air power, the Vietnam War might very well have been lost in the 1960s. Air power was literally a lifesaver when used to support beleaguered troops on the ground. The enemy was decimated when he chose to fight in large units as he did, for example, at Khe Sanh in 1968. But air power was not well suited to fight a guerrilla war. A tremendous amount of fire from the sky was rained upon an enemy who was most of the time invisible, mobile, and traveling in small units. Some critics describe this part of the air war as using a sledgehammer to kill a gnat. With all of the bombs we dropped, with all the sophisticated weapons we brought into play, with all the fighters and bombers and gunships, with all the billions of dollars we spent on the air war, the Ho Chi Minh Trail remained busy. Men and supplies moving south. The air war punished the enemy, but it did not defeat him. This is Walter Cronkite, and this has been another in a continuing series of video cassettes on the Vietnam War. <laughs>